This is uh, HRT 125, Plants and Society, uh, Unit 15, Ecology, and this is part two of this presentation. In the first part, we talked about some biomes. You saw some pictures of the United States, of the world, with different areas. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, many of these different biomes. Uh, you will be working together as groups by yourself to do a, a presentation, uh, whether it's PowerPoint, Prezi, or Vizio presentation on some of these different areas. And hopefully we'll get even a more in-depth idea of what these different biomes are. The taiga, uh, you saw that it's in the northern areas of the North American continent, the uh, European continent. Uh, this is a forest, a uh, boreal forest. And you remember, because it's so cold, it's going to have a very short growing season. Yet, during this very short growing season, when the snow is off the evergreens, it has a tremendous amount of oxygen and CO2 exchange in here. The soil is not very good. Uh, it's very acidic. Um, the number of animals that live up here are very slim. The animals that do live up here have to have uh, special techniques for getting the nutrients out of these mostly conifers which are up there. Because of the cool temperature, the the needles that fall, the leaves that might fall down there, very, very slowly decompose. A part of this is the alpine tundra. Uh, when you look upon the hills, remember that the oxygen content is down, the pressure is different, the rains that come are very quick and heavy, so a lot of the nutrients are washed away. It's cold most of the time. So plants have to be very active to live here. The temperate forest uh, is the area that we're mostly concerned with now. As you live in the Midwest, we look out there, we see the change in colors in the fall. This is an area that we're all relative to see now. We see the, the fall colors change. We see that the leaves start to drop. Uh, this is an area that um, uh, there's a, a large amount of de debris on the ground. The temperatures are warm enough, so these decompose. We have little niches along the way here, for example, in the Pacific Northwest. Pacific Northwest forests, they turn out, they get a lot of nutrients from salmon. Uh, the salmon come up the river, and the bears uh, take the salmon out. And as they uh, want to eat the salmon, the best parts of the salmon, they eat the uh, ovaries and the brain, which has the most nutrients, and they discard the rest of the salmon out there. So if we examine the, the trees and the grasses out there for the DNA of salmon, we see it's very high in these things. So removing the salmon by putting dams here can affect the forest. Along the same area are the lower mountain areas. The lower mountain areas, the chaparral, the wind is strong. When the water comes, it comes down fast and moves through the area very quickly. So the roots have to be very, very active. The leaves have to be very active so they can't be thick. Um, again, they don't withstand uh, freezing temperatures. An idea of the grassland biomes are savannas. Uh, we think of these in Africa with this picture of the elephant. Uh, we also have the grasslands in the Midwest prairies of the steppes of Russia, which are filled with uh, grasses. And there are many interconnected food webs in these areas. For example, the elephant. The elephant uh, can reach up high to get as much food as he wants. However, as he walks through, 
his legs kick through the grasses. And as he does this, he dislodges insects. So birds follow behind him to eat these insects. He's, they're clever enough to realize that grasses are very stingy with their nitrogen. So they have to eat a large amount of nitrogen. And one of the reasons that you see herds migrating is to get as much nitrogen as possible from the grass. So they eat the grass. The closer to the ground the grass is, the more nitrogen gets inside of it. As they move along to different areas, you see more and more migra migration. The grass then is continues to grow, build fresh grass, and so better nitrogen for them to transfer into their own bodies. Another example of better nitrogen use is many animals then will regurgitate this back into their mouth, which is called chewing the cud, where they chew the grass a second time to get even more uh, nitrogen out of the soil. The rainforest, we picture these in South America and Africa, uh, filled with an abundance of plants that grow very quickly. Vines, lianas, grow very quickly. And what we find are different layers of how plants grow. There's a large amount of plants that don't receive much sun, which are in the bottom of the rainforest. They have thicker leaves. The leaves are shaped in such a way as to funnel the water to their roots. We have lianas, which are quickly climb up a tree to get as much sunlight as possible. We have plants that evolve to be high up in the trees. Uh, for example, the orchids and bromeliads, uh, their roots exist on water that may be found in the cracks along the trees. There may be water that rain. And so they're very good at extracting water very quickly. Again, each of these are rely upon each other. Uh, the Brazil nut tree is found in this area. Its nuts require a specialized animal to get into the nuts. There's a special rodent that is able to cut through the outer shell of the nut and then move the seeds themselves from area to area. Uh, the Brazil nut tree re requires a special pollination. And because of this, uh, we cannot do Brazil nuts uh, outside of the rainforest. The, the Brazil nuts flowers require only male orchid bees to pollinate them. Male orchid bees come to the flower to get a special perfume that the female orchid bees bite. Female orchid bees do not go to the uh, Brazil nut tree. So if the orchid plant is removed from the Brazil nut tree, it sets off a whole cascade where the it is not pollinated anymore because the male bees will not come there anymore. So we have to be careful with these huge webs and don't destroy them. Down in the south part of the United States, we had a wonderful civilization there. Cahokia is in southern Illinois. In both of these big societies, perhaps of well over millions of people, disappeared. And why did they disappear? Did they overutilize the land? Did they farm so much they got rid of the water? Did they build that they cut down all the trees? Something happened to them. Both of them were skilled farmers. They both disappeared around 1800. What happened? Did they not understand sustainability? How many people can the earth sustain? What can we do? What would happen if the rest of the world had only one half of the United States standard of living? At this point in time, we cannot sustain that. We do not have the resources to fill to feed all the people just at one half of the United States standard of living. What do we do about uh, energy? What a fuel? We have coal, we have oil. What do we do about this? We have to remember that 
we may run out of fossil fuel by the year 2025. What are we going to do about water? Right now, we use up about 50% of the fresh water utilized all the time. In the previous chapter, I showed you a picture of a huge water table that extends from uh, the Dakotas down to Texas. Trillions of gallons of water, which is being used up. How do we get that all back? How do we give enough water to the people in India when the Himalaya glaciers are gradually disappearing because of global warming? What do we do? We have to remember that we have to work with the earth to sustain all of our products. Um, here's a picture of the, the land use out there. Remember that water comprises over 70% of the earth. So we have to look at this, that what do we do with the rest of the land? How do we save that? Agriculture uses only 12% out here. We are turning more and more of this into desert. How do we prevent that change? Sustainability is the way to do that right now. We can look at, um, here's an island in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, different years apart, 11 years apart. In both images, the tropical rainforests are the darkest color there. What has happened is the plantations came along. The trees were cut down. The fires came along. And pretty soon, we have hardly any tropical rainforest there. We have to find a way to protect these areas. We have to um, look in there and see, are there different ways for us to work with the forest? Is there a different way for us to save these trees so they come back? In the United States, for every tree that is cut down, uh, between five and 10 are planted. So we have a way to protect that. Do we have to cut down the whole tree? If we cut down just one of the major stems, the most trees will send out multiple shoots afterwards. We have to cut down every tree in a certain area instead of cutting down only selective trees along the way. We have learned that there are different ways for us to do this and to save the trees and to save the land. We look throughout the world here and some areas are more in trouble than other areas right here. Here's some areas right now that we worry about. We worry about that we may lose them. We look into the area uh, along the ocean. Because of global warming, we may lose some of the islands in uh, Micronesia. We may lose some of the islands of Malaysia as the water raises. One of the things we found is that because of global water, global warming, the water level is rising every year. It may be that in 20 years from now, the water level will be two feet higher. And if that's true, many of the islands of the South Pacific will be gone. Madagascar will be gone. Uh, all of the smaller islands in Malaysia will be gone as well as many of the lands in the Mediterranean. We need to look at all these areas and see what we can do to save them. Right now, Mother Earth has a way of protecting many of these lands. If it is left alone, uh, the Earth will bring back areas. Uh, and this particular area is right here. Uh, the land was destroyed. Uh, whether it was fire, volcano, uh, lack of rain, there was nothing there. Plants will come back to this area. As long as there's some water, as long as there's some cracks, seeds will get there. We have seen different plants uh, get into these areas and have them regrow again. Uh, the first is fireweed up there in that corner. It gradually comes in there gets into the cracks, uh, and as the roots grow, it loosens up the soil. So it allows the next group of plants to come in there. The next group of plants that come in there 
find the soil is a little less firm so their seeds can get in there and break up the soil even more and this will continue with the mountain avens coming then trees start to come in the alder trees alder trees then bring in uh, different fungus and bacteria furthermore to, to change the soil and as this changes the soil we start to see pine trees such as spruce trees come in and break up the soil and as these continue to break up the soils then the bigger oak trees and hickory trees will come in we have places where we experiment here uh, biosphere 2 is a area in the southwest united states where we tr try to create different biomes so we can see what can we do to save them if uh, one dome is a desert one dome is a tropical forest what can we do to change the soil what can we do to change the entire environment uh, to save these different biomes we have to learn that we need to utilize other biomes in an orthodoxal fashion only recently we, we discovered that the forests have different plants out there that we can utilize well, years ago we discovered that um, on the rubber trees we could take uh, rubber or latex out there and use them to make tires use them in different fashion now we're learning that there's many other products that we can use for example different nuts if you take nuts and bring them to poor countries this increases the amount of nutrients that people have so that instead of giving milk and meat to poor countries if you give water and nuts you may actually increase the amount of proteins and calories that poor nations may get people in the past saw that the bees were very important but we have ignored it until until recently there's different plants out there that we have not utilized before and that is one we found now that we can take this plant that we has not been utilized until recently and use it for a variety of different products we can make it into paper we can make it into clothing we can even take the oil from its seeds and use it to run machinery so that there are many other plants that have been around for thousands of years that we can use for other reasons <laughs>